Okay, so we are all set for session two, workshop on valve disease. Uh, speaker, we have the esteemed presence of Dr. J. Shri Mohan and Dr. Madhu Shukla. Uh, thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry for the technical glitch. We would have a, an, an hour session on valvular heart disease and uh, scanning with me would be the, my colleague, Dr. Madhu Shukla. Um, uh, valvular heart disease is present in more than 50% of the population above the age of 65 years and mild valvular heart disease in 44% of all individuals above the age of uh, 65 years. Moderate to severe in 5%, aortic sclerosis in 2%, MAC in 1.3%. All of these are significant. And of course, valvular heart disease is an epidemic of this century. The, as the age advances, as we live longer, uh, valvular heart disease would increase. So it's not a, only a question of rheumatic heart disease in this country, but largely it is degenerative valvular heart disease which we are going to encounter more and more as we live longer and as the population grows up. The US data says the commonest, aortic val uh, the commonest valvular disease is aortic stenosis followed by mitral regurgitation and that is why for both of these there are now percutaneous um, castor based interventions available. The uh, aortic valve disease accounts for, in the Western world, aortic valve disease accounts for nearly 60% of all mortality. And then there is, of course, mortality because of mitral valve disease, which is 15%. The uh, valvular heart disease, as I said, the commonest de degenerate in the Western world, in our country, probably post-inflammatory, which actually is a euphemism for Rheumatic heart disease is the commonest uh, valvular heart disease. And of course, it can be congenital, it can be functional, it can be iatrogenic. Essentially, valvular heart disease presents in three ways. It can be stenotic, well can be stenotic, well can be regurgitant, or well can be combination of stenotic and regurgitant. Now, I just uh, have to say the first stenotic lesions, key measurements are well morphometry maximum velocity, mean gradient, and valve area. For regurgitant lesions, you have to again look at valve morphometry, calculation of regurgitant orifice area, regurgitant volume, and regurgitant fraction. However, there are many more qualitative and semi-quantitative signs for regurgitation, and we will be discussing that. Why should we be doing echo in valvular heart disease? Because we want to make a diagnosis, we want to get an idea about etiology, about prognosis, treatment. After intervention, we want to follow them up. We want to look at the device management, especially if you have put prosthetic devices. And of course, need for transcatheter treatment. And you can look at uh, reverse remodeling. As I said, etiopathogenesis is degenerative, congenital, and rheumatic. Be it, and the two commonest diseases are, of course, mitral valve disease and and of course, uh, um, aortic valve disease. And uh, today we will be confining ourselves to native valvular heart disease, hopefully. And, uh, but of course, we have to remember prosthetic valve heart disease also increasing significantly. And currently in this country, more than 200,000 individuals are undergoing prosthetic valve implantations. A reliable detection of valvular disease requires systemic, uh, systematic echocardiography. The reason, you can only diagnose by auscultation 10% of all valvular heart disease. So now, as good as you might consider yourself as a clinician, keep in mind that auscultation has limitations. And you just detect 10% of all patients by valvular heart disease. So the whole life I spent actually auscultating patients and of course, trying to uh, get these students, uh, you know, commit to what kind of lesions these are, what is the severity. The fact remains that the auscultation actually plays a small role. We do uh, have stages of valvular heart disease, which are not concerned about the echocardiography. What we are concerned as an echocardiographer is for accurate assessment of valvular heart disease, we need to establish a critical nexus between valve complex anatomy, valve hemodynamics, ventricular function, pulmonary and systemic vascular resistance. So 
I would end by saying that uh, as Galileo said, measure what is measurable and make measurable what is not so. That is the funda mental basis of evaluating valvular heart disease. You have to measure every single thing which you can. So why do we want to measure the things? Because severity decides extent of disease and hence need for intervention. Marker of reverse remodeling is also decided by quantitation, prognosis, need for intervention, need for re-intervention and when to accept the results of the procedure. You do PTMC, when do you expect, accept the results? You got to have some some quantitative parameter. That is exactly what we... And in the end, I would like to say that the valvular heart disease and effervescent field is not a dying uh, subject. With a lot of new and exciting discoveries about auto-quantification by echocardiography, uh, imaging modality integration, fusion imaging, which now uh, is there with, uh, with fluoroscopy, with CT and MRI, and more and more of that is being... Uh, uh, shown and being published. Phenotyping of valvular heart disease can be done by artificial intelligence uh, where you can actually feed the DICOM data of the echo plus the, the medical records and you can get a phenotype and of course the need for percutaneous interventions and repairs and not to mention the fact that uh, 3D printing is playing a big role in uh, Evaluation of valvular heart disease and its management. With those words, we would like to go on with the case. Okay, so we have a slight change in the program, and uh, for some reasons, uh, Dipuda has asked us to uh, scan a patient who has uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is just a kind of uh, uh, fly in the ointment. We'll get back to valvular heart disease. So, Dr. Madhu, okay. is going to Dr. Madhu is going to scan, and I would actually try to explain to you the things. So, my way of doing is, I just let them bring it here. So, uh, first thing, regardless of uh, whatever is the case, uh, the way we start and we strongly recommend uh, to you is to start with inferior vena, looking at inferior vena cava in a subcostal view. And the reason is because that is going to tell you about the right atrial pressure and also a lot of oh, other hemorrhage. Right. So, instead of going straight to the precordium, uh, we strongly suggest that you start with this subcostal uh, There is another reason why we, we need to tell you that because there are many diseases which are connected with liver and hepatic veins, liver, uh, heart disease. So we definitely want to look at hepatic veins. Every single, every single case, hepatic veins, inferior vena cava, and more and more now we are looking at portal vein and I would tell you why because there is a strong relationship between the liver disease and heart diseases, hepatopulmonary syndrome and hepatocardic syndromes. We wouldn't talk about portal vein today, but some other time will give you an opportunity. You have to measure the size of the portal vein and portal vein Doppler because it has great significance. Diagnosing portal hypertension, which has an indirect relationship with a lot of heart disease. But anyhow, we confine to him. To, um, we, um, and whenever we look at the inferior vena cava, we always try to put a respirometer. Can we do that? Yes. Yeah. So we'll have a, another physiological parameter besides the ECG. Good. So this, I actually, instead of using uh, cumbersome uh, tech, uh, we are, uh, 
cumbersome words, we will we call it a long axis of inferior vena cava. This is when you place the task, so the cursor is pointing towards the left shoulder, you get a long axis view. And what she has interrogated, of course, is the hepatic veins. And you are seeing the uh, uh, hepatic vein flow, both systolic diastole and flow reversal. Marked flow reversal is seen actually in the, with the atrial contraction. Uh, all, and there is some respiratory variation, but uh, uh, we wouldn't actually at the moment go in detail because we would be talking about that subsequently next day. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Dr. So, what is your impression about it? So, this is one of the areas where I still believe you should do an M board. You will get seven, eight beads where you can find out what is the what is the inspiratory variation of the inferior vena cava. Can we do uh, M board, Dr. Uh, M board, yes. yes. Of the inferior vena cava. Yes, yes. That is although in people are not recommending use of inferior M mode. This is one area which I strongly suggest because you get a good idea whether how much the inferior vena cava collapsing with inspiration and that gives you a rough clue about the right atrial pressure. You already know if there is no collapse or less than 20 percent collapse mean right atrial pressure about 15 and if there is a good collapse more than 50 percent is about 3 to 5 millimeter and then when you are less than 50 percent around 10 millimeter. So we, we are seeing a pretty good collapse. Yeah, we are pretty good collapse, more than 50 percent. So the right atrial pressure normal. We we know that Nelson Schiller said three millimeters. The the ASC said five millimeter. Consider three or five millimeter, whichever way you want to. Doesn't make a difference. Don't think that every, anything is Bible. It's not a. It's not really the the uh, holy grail. It's normal right atrial pressure in this particular individual. All right, let's go further. Just turn, sir. Okay. So then we start with the parastinal views and uh, usually in adults we start with a parastinal long axis view, first take a standard parastinal long axis view and then take of course uh, some off axis parastinal long view to show more of aorta and more of apex. Here of course. Uh, an important past part of the story is that she is bringing parasitic long axis view and we we can clearly, can I have a pointer please? No. So obviously we can see that the, the both the anterior interventricular septum and the infralateral wall are markedly thickened. And we need to measure the thickness for a very different reason. And that is because you have to decide about the risk edification. Uh, any, any wall thickness in diastole more than 30 millimeter is, an is one of the risk markers actually when you are calculating the whole score for deciding about ICD. So she has a 34 millimeter in diastole, the, the anti interventional septum, she has the same, almost same is the infralateral wall, so-called pusky wall or infralateral wall, and she is measuring a little beyond the, the yeah, mitral, which yeah. is pretty it much is, all right. It is, it is, yeah. But you see a large pericardial effusion. You see a large pericardial effusion, this and is this is interesting. Pericardial effusion is present in 10% cases of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But the first thing when you see pericardial effusion with thick heart should come to your mind is amyloidosis. Always consider amyloidosis first possibility. But we did present one paper on peri uh, pericardial effusion in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy sometime back, 10 percent. What do they correlate? It usually correlates with pulmonary hypertension. Presence of pericardial effusion in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy correlates with the uh, pulmonary hypertension and also correlates to right ventricle function. We will come back to that, but, but the, these 60 percent patients of people who have wall thickness or hypertrophy and have pericardial effusion finally turn out to be amyloidosis. Keep that thing in mind. They turn out to be amyloidosis. You, you have to seriously if I was given this picture and I didn't have anything else, I, do, I don't have any 
genetic studies or anything. I will definitely ask for a light chain analysis, the light chain immuno uh, uh, analysis, and if that is negative, I will go do a pyrophosphate scan. Every single person. The reason, 25% of cases of typical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy diagnosed by you and me are actually amyloidosis. So in, in a recent study from, uh, from one of the uh, big centers, even hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, when you diagnose, all, as much as one-fourth of them, despite having a gradient, are turn out to be ATTR. So just keep that thing in mind. I just thought that we will uh, let you know about that. Now the question is, how do you decide between two an echocardiography? The first thing is, Look at the mitral valve carefully. Let us look at okay. the mitral valve. Not for SAM, not for ASH, which of course have been described in cardiac amyloidosis, but we want to see the length of the anterior mitral leaflet and thickening. Those are structures which are peculiar to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Mitral valve abnormalities, intrinsic mitral valve abnormalities do not occur in amyloidosis. So if you have a length which is more than 25 millimeter anti-mitral leaflet, thickening more than 4 millimeter, chances are you might be dealing with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy even without doing beta heavy chain. Uh, how much is this? 30. 38 millimeter. That pretty much in my mind is an idea that we are dealing with the case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and not amyloidosis. So, if why I am trying to tell you, whenever you see this kind of picture, you have to look at length of the anti-mitral leaflet, which is at the aortomitral junction to the very tip where cord is attached in diastole. Can you show it again? Yeah. 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 This is the one. So, Dr. Madhu, uh, you I, have to see. We here uh, still have to. See, yeah. This it's, is the aortomitral uh, junction. Where is my cursor? Yeah. You know. This is my. The mitral. You can show. Okay. But this is cystic. This is it is from here, where the junction you can you have to take. No, so, but you know, it shows the aortic valve. Aortic valve, okay. Yeah, we, okay. because we need to find out where is the aortomitral curtain. Yeah, that is the aortomitral curtain here. Yeah. Okay, and and and, and those are the this, cords. Yeah. 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 That this that is, is okay. So that 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 goes up to the tip. That is okay. So from here we shall take. Yeah. Anna? And up to here. Yeah. From here. Uh, that, and go, Give a picture go right up to the tip, go right up to the tip, good, it's same, 36 millimeter, 36. anything about 25 millimeter strongly suggests that you are dealing with a case of 50 percent of these patients have mitral valve abnormalities. But then remember that uh, there will always be some overlaps here and there. If a patient or hypertroph, uh, if a patient has for some reason aortic regurgitation, AML length can increase. This is called heteromeric adaptation of the AML to volume overload. Right. So, uh, Dr. Madhu, what are we going to measure? In a, first thing is, give me the diastolic RV wall thickness because this is, okay. we already said that this individual would have RV involvement and pulmonary hypertension since the patient has got, patient has got pericardial effusion. So, we would like to see your measurement This okay. is 7 millimeters. So, Light. more than 5 millimeters suggests right ventricle hypertrophy. There is anterior pericardial effusion, there is posterior yeah. pericardial effusion. This, so, uh, can we uh, can we now, Dr. Madhu, look at in this particular view uh, any uh, systolic anterior motion? Yes, yes. We can yeah. You can, you actually the RV OT thickness is the best view. I know the subcostal and RV free wall have been talked about quite often, but in in my view actually RV OT wall thickness is the best way to measure. That is the first chamber, part of the chamber which is actually encountering the high pressure. You you are absolutely right. Actually, the subcostal view is the way to measure RV free wall. But you can have a regional hypertrophy and, and how much is the uh, cutoff point? 5 millimeter five and five more. Five. More than 5 millimeter. But we will measure the free wall. We will show you. 
will spend some more time. Same as subcostal. Yes, same as subcostal. But we'll spend some more time on that. But Dr. Madhu, let us look at the SAM. Yes. Uh, See, this is the, uh, I will start from the diastole. Yeah, uh, go to the. Here. This is end diastole. Yes. And then I'm moving in the systole. Yeah. It is closing, closing and then moving anterior. I, I so don't set. think, I don't think the valve is moving. It's the whole cavity is getting smaller. No. But you know, the, the next thing we should talk about is where are the papillary muscles placed? Are they placed in normal forehand and interclock position? And are there additional papillary muscles? Because those are the features of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Well, sure. So from here we should go to, we should measure the left atrium quickly because that will give us, a, that would give us quickly an idea about um, the, uh, the filling pressure because that correlates with the filling pressure. Let us measure the, le the left atrium, inner edge to inner edge. In cis in, and cisly, inner edge to inner edge at the level of the aortic valve. Pardon? Yeah, we, we, we are going to spend some time on papillary muscle, definitely. Because uh, anterior displacement of the papillary muscle is a typical thing which found in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, myocardial crypts are another thing which we will be looking for. Not that they are very specific, but each of them adds a point. Each of them gives a point. Okay, 47. So the left atrium enlarged, we know filling pressure is elevated. So obviously from corollary, we know that the patient would have pulmonary hypertension and that is probably the cause of pericardial effusion. Now we'll check the short axis view. Dr. Madhu, short axis view, we'll, we'll take three views of the ventricle and then of course one at the base, maybe two at the base. Okay, so short, this, this is, is short axis at the, uh, at the level of... Papillary. More near the apex, this is more near the apex, Dr. Madhu. Wall okay. thickness is pericardial effusion is clearly seen. Come down, show me the, yeah, yeah, that's true, that is good. So, anterior mitral leaflet, posterior mitral leaflet, you don't see any SAM. And now go to pap muscle level. We want to see whether there is any additional papillary muscle. Yeah, slightly lower down. Slight anti displacement. So, this is at uh, uh, this is nearly at one o'clock position. The anterolateral papillary muscle is at one o'clock position. So, there is a displacement, but we don't see any crypt so far. And go to the apex, please. Yeah, that is all. The apex is when you really see it's completely squeezed out and you don't see much of right ventricle. So, that, that's all right. So, let us go to the aortic level, short axis at the level of aorta. All right, three leaflets of the aortic valve. One of the commonest actually mistakes we do when diagnose hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, missing the subaortic membrane. So subaortic membrane is always seen in parasol long axis view. You can again go to parasol long axis view, zoom up the LVOT, okay. see that there is no subaortic membrane. I, why I am talking of this thing, we recently saw a patient who actually had alcohol ablation in everything and no effect and then finally patient came to us follow up, we realized the patient has subaortic membrane. The patient had an alcohol uh, septal ablation in one of the topmost institutions of the country. They just missed the subaortic membrane. In subaortic membrane you don't put alcohol. All right, so they, that's pulmonary valve. You, you want to do something uh, with the pulmonary valve, you want to tell me how much is the pulmonary pressure, pulmonary valve exhalation time? Yes. Just pulse Doppler at valve little proximal to the valve, maybe a millimeter proximal, yeah. Okay. Okay, let's see how good are they. Good, good, you are getting good. 100 speed please. Speed. 100. Slightly. Okay, the second and third are good enough. Okay, fine. It's not a good. Uh, okay. You can reject. Try to try to get it better. Try to get it better. I Move know. the cursor a little bit, maybe beyond the pulmonary valve. Yeah, this is all right. This is all right, Dr. Madhu. I, 
I think we will save again. some time. Otherwise, we'll be here whole day. Okay, okay. So let's measure. We have recorded that. No, or you, no. You want I'm to do it again? Scale increase and this you have to. Yes, this one is okay. I'm not too sure actually. I I would find it hard to find out where to put the. the thing. No. Okay, what we'll do is we'll put it on the uh, on the, uh, the 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 last point and see how much the palm acceleration time. Is it okay? All no, right, just show okay. me. The... And uh, now measure and uh, is it? Uh, there is too much of reject, time. but that's okay. You. Uh, yeah. So we, we can use simple uh, Goldstein's formula, 80 minus half of palmy well acceleration time will give you mean palmy RT pressure. We don't want to go Somewhere, in yes. the other formula, 92 uh, minus 0.61 into palmy acceleration time so plus 2. I mean, th that's difficult to remember. So I, I remember, th this is actually, there is a formula for pin heads. 80 minus half of the palmy acceleration time is... Uh, I will go in the other one, no? I am not very sure. Uh, this this would be better. You, yes. you could. From where measure. are you measuring? I will measure. Yeah, from here. From here. Okay. And okay. Here. Okay. Okay. It comes you, almost normal. You you want to say that the palm is active? All right. We'll come back to this it's point. I disagree like on Let's that, see. but but this 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 does not mean that the patient doesn't have palm hypertension. It only means we have issues with regard to measurement. Forget about it. Let us talk. Uh, let us actually now go to uh, apical views. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. We should look for RVOTK. Uh, here's a point because we did report actually uh, cases. But remember, 50% uh, of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are biventricular. That is the first thing. And as far as biventricular obstruction is concerned, that has been described uh, in in certain number. The number is variable, but about two percent or so. Yeah, you can check the gradient. Acceleration time will not be. Yeah, there so is if, some if, gradient. if you have RVOT gradient, then the acceleration time becomes problematic. Yeah, then yeah. it of course is not reliable at all. Uh, you can put There's a, some a turbulence there. There's some turbulence uh, there. Definite, de definite obstruction is there. No. No, but you are too much of reject. You are too much of reject. Yeah. Patient is moving. Yeah, there is there is some gradient. Just I we know that we are not we are not in the line. We are not in the line of fire. But it's okay. We we know that there is a gradient of up to a two meter velocity. Yeah. So that's the reason I think the the pat was not coming. Yeah, yeah. That that's true. You are not getting that thing, but. But okay, now we'll go to apical. We'll start with a, a four chamber, then two chamber, then a five chamber or three chamber. Another thought by the time she gets the apical four. So do you measure the LV thickness in short axis view? I always measure in short axis in all, all the six segments six in all the three levels. So the, uh, the uh, in fact, it has been suggested that the wall thickness in short axis Except for yes. the lateral wall, which is an isotropic, which is um, which is isotropic, the other ones are not, which are an isotropic, the other ones are very good. Apical cardio, I, I don't think there is any particular measurement written where to measure it. I think it's more of a qualitative uh, stuff. When you, yeah. But uh, but uh, this is good. You are getting a good four chamber view, Dr. Madhu. I am satisfied. Mm -hmm. And and of course, uh, we uh, is there anything we are adding to this? Uh, any uh, uh, can you zoom it up? Show me the crypts. Yeah, you are showing the crypts much better. Yeah. yeah. Lower down that scale. Lower down that scale. Okay. Nyquist limit to maybe 40, yeah, the script, the crypts are much better seen. Yeah, yeah, crypts are much better seen, that, that's good. So th there is actually also, we know that there is an overlap between non-compaction hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, same genetic, this thing. So you would see these kind of crypts and trabecular, intertrabecular recessive 
quite commonly between the two. Yeah, that, that's okay. First time. Yeah, those are the crypts. Uh, okay, you want to now do a... No, but you are too much of, uh, too much of reject, you know, to reduce the reject. It must touch the baseline. Reduce the uh, reject further. Yes, that is good. That is good. That is good. So you are trying to show the... Uh, at the uh, tips of the leaflet in diastole, you are showing us that the E is smaller than the A. And the A wave is something like 120 centimeter, E is about 60 centimeter, desolation time is prolonged. So the patient has abnormal relaxation. You won't call it grade 1 diastole dysfunction. You know why? Because for grade 1 diastole dysfunction, the E has to be less than 50 centimeter. So the commonest mistake I see everybody making, they will call it grade 1 diastole dysfunction. Grade 1 has to have an E wave less than 50 centimeters per second. And sir, the A wave also starts after 20 uh, uh, centimeters per second. Yeah. It's starting uh, above the level of 20 uh, uh, this this level, yes. Yeah. So if it starts above 20, then also it's not uh, grade 1 because the A wave. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Actually, part of this reason is there is a, a abnormal relaxation still occurring. There is a hidden L wave there. There, is a, there would be a hidden L wave, you can't make it out because it has to come down actually and then go up. Absolutely right. That tells you that relaxation, there is still a atrioventricular gradient happening, which actually means the left atrial pressure is high because the LV diastolic pressure hasn't <coughs> gone down to zero. Unless it goes down to zero, it will not touch the zero. So that point will not touch the, okay. Then. So we have seen crypts, we have seen uh, a transmodal flow pattern. Uh, show us any gradient, you, continuous wave Doppler rest or provocate. Of course, you should always do provocation. You can do um, hand grip, you can do Valsalva, amyl nitrate, I don't know. We keep saying, I don't have amyl nitrate. I mean, how many of you have amyl nitrate? You don't have it. All right. The, uh, the other, of course, phenotyping is you, you try to do a phenotyping which, which says uh, the, uh, the normal curvature, reverse curvature, apical, the, uh, you, you can do many of those things. But you, sh you know that the reverse curvature type is usually 80% of the genotype positive. Yeah. So that is, uh, you, you need to, this is reverse curvature, you know the curvature is here. And then, then the, you can have a neutral curvature, a neutral curvature. More often, gen uh, neutral curvature and apical are more often genotype negative. So, yeah, you are getting some gradient. You are some uh, getting mid and late systolic gradient, but I'm not sure how much. Gradient is greater in LVOT side. Yeah, uh, go to the LVOT side. Yeah, and see. Yeah, very good. Yeah, now you are getting the rate. Yeah, yeah, you have uh, about five meters, close to five meters, and it is uh, shows mitral regurgitation. Yeah, can this be mitral regurgitation, sir? Because yeah. we can't see the uh, dagger shape. You know, it, uh, uh, the initial part I think is mitral regurgitation. That initial part is mitral regurgitation, and after that, it, can, uh, can you show us mitral regurgitation, please? Yes. So there is hardly any mitral regurgitation. This, this is all no, because but, uh, of. But in the isolement relaxation phase, you can see some jet of MR. Uh, yes, you can see some a little bit of that. You uh, can you put the uh, pulse Doppler again there? Not the CW pulse Doppler in the LVOT. Same view. Uh, put it just at the AML level. AM. Okay. Yeah. And bring down the. Yeah. Okay, now you can put the same place CW. No, I was, uh, no, a gradient there, I was trying to look at uh, the, any isovolume relaxation wave during IVRT here. 
So I'm not getting it. So sometimes you see big waves there because of regional heterogeneity about the 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 what do you call as fall or decay of the intraventricular pressure. Pardon? Yes, tracing it looks like MR. Yeah, in the but by seeing the tracing, previous tracing, when you saw the previous tracing, that was on a, on a 50 speed. You did, you couldn't appreciate. This is dagger shape. Yeah. No, that was because the speed was less. This is at 100 speed. This is, uh, yeah, this is speed is more. So. Um, Just uh, scan the RV cavity, if there is a gradient in RV cavity. RV cavity? Yeah. Okay. And measure the, sub, uh, the uh, in subcostal view, RV wall thickness. Is all right, there is none actually. It is not there. Yeah. Get back to subcostal view, Dr. Madhu, and let us look at the RV free wall. Yeah, that is, that is, here of course the wall thickness is much more. So you, you do realize that, uh, yeah, uh, nicely, tough, but I would, I would some, measure somewhere Sub here. Subcostal view is also recommended for measurement of, subcostal view is the standard view for measuring the RP. Like yes, outside. you can measure ma multiple different ways actually, this is, this is, this is really, Biventricular hypertrophy, uh, pericardial effusion. Pericardial effusion, as I said, actually has prognostic significance, but also you should seriously, even with the biventricular hypertrophy, I, I would still, in, a, in this particular patient, regardless of whatever we are talking about, anti-mitral leaflet, I will definitely get a, a light chain immuno um, analysis done, of a light chain protein analysis done, and a PYP scan also. The pericardial effusion should bother you. That happens, happens the, 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 uh, the National Amyloid Center uh, from UK says 60% of amyloid have pericardial infusion versus 10% of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Ratio is so different. Uh, in this case, the bone scan is mandatory. Bone scan is mandatory. Because this is strongly suspect amyloid. Pardon? Strongly suspect amyloid. I, I would, I would, if, when I see pericardial infusion, this is the way I will go forward. Sir, how frequently we get? Uh, so, so what what happens is that uh, all features of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, except mitral abnormality, can be seen in amyloid. All features. Even the LVOT gradient, sir. Yeah. Even the LVOT. LVOT. So, so there is a there is a recent paper. I so the so if time permits, I will show you a case. So we have a case of uh, hypertrophic or. A typical hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, typical gradient, everything. Now, this patient actually has one episode of syncope, so an ICD is put. And the patient doing fine, actually. The patient comes to me and I said, you know what, we will get your uh, further analysis done. Yeah, we, we should look at that also, but that should be seen again in subcostal view. Can you look at intraatrial septum uh, thickness? Yeah. This this also bothers me. See this one. Are we free wall nodularity and thickness bothers me a lot. This bothers me a lot. Uh, Dr. Madhu, concentrate in the subcostal view on the interatrial septal thickness. Okay. Uh, so uh, so I was telling you the hyper, typical hyper. I said look, we will get your uh, the uh, light chain protein analysis done. It turned out uh, it turned out to be positive actually. Oh, and so yeah. we got a bone marrow bone done, stone, yeah. plasma cell discrete. And yeah. this person was given even an ICD and everything. Now, what happens is such people can get syncope for a different reason. Their blood pressure falls down. They have, they have autonomic neuropathy. Yeah. I have amyloid people have autonomic neuropathy. They don't, don't tolerate antihypertensive drugs well. So sometimes you give 20 milligram telmisartan, their blood pressure drop. They can have syncope. All I'm trying to say is that there is an overlap. I have a case actually. I was uh, thinking to. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Interatal septum, Dr. Madhu. No, this is not interatal. This is your. Um, uh, no, no, no. Inter you are measuring oh, interventricular septum. septum. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry.
looks slightly thickened. That is all I can say. Yeah, I <laughs> Sir, cardiac but, MRI picks up the that finding very well. Interatrial septal. Yes, sure. Even even CT can pick up very well the interatrial septal thickness. Um, so, Dr. Madhu, the, the last this looks thickened definitely. Actually, it, is, it should not exceed five millimeter. Uh, last uh, just one last point shows the uh, free wall of the right atrium, and we are we are ending with this case. The, the, you are doing the four chamber view. Show me the right atrial free wall. Uh, in epigastric view. Or four chamber view. Four chamber. Four chamber view. Okay. Four. Yes, yes. That is that is another thing, Dr. Madhu. The the uh, the cherry on top. You have to show us the if the four chamber. Okay. Or kya hua? Abhi itna acha aa raha tha. Kya hua? Nee, wo sab epigastric. I'll do it again. Wo thoda turn kar. Na ha. Okay, for, uh, you know, for brevity's sake, since we are running short of time, mm -hmm. you can do a, a strain only on four four chamber. No, no, I have. Missed. There also you can show apical sparing. No, we we are now, you know, you can run one of those uh, recorded views of four chamber. That would be better, especially okay, 22, okay. number 22. This is what I was saying. This is what I am talking about. Nodular thickening is sensitivity actually is about. 12, 13 percent, but specificity is above 90 percent actually when you see this nodular thickening of the RV free, uh, RA free wall. Uh, just I wanted to see the apex because this looks short, more shorter. Yes, you can see the aneurysm. You know, you can do it just DLS here. We will uh, see that, we will consider that representative of all the three views. We we are just little running short of time. Okay, okay, okay. That okay. nodularity should bother you. It actually has some 12-13% sensitivity, but very high specificity. Okay. Multiple features actually are suggestive of uh, cardiac amyloid. We are not saying the, uh, the difference-wise, prevalence-wise, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy mm -hmm. is nearly 100 times more prevalent. So. You, uh, if you talk of statistically, it could, it could be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but I will definitely yeah. do both a PYP scan and a, a light chain, chain protein analysis. No, no, LV. LV, LV. We just want. No, we want to take LV. Yeah. Go ahead. LV. Yeah, that, that's all right. From here, you can can choose the point. But the, the apical sparing part again uh, the yes, RSI yes. or the original strain index uh, initially when Jim That's Thomas reported right. they reported a high sensitivity and specificity which was closer to 90 percent. The current data actually from the uh, UK National Amyloid Center says its uh, sensitivity is uh, something more in the, in the range of about 50% specificity is about 70%. So it's not, nothing very great actually. How much of a region of interest is being taken? Region of interest, the, 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 um, uh, the inner line, much. inner line should be actually inside the cavity. No, no, it takes the middle should be right in the, uh, right on a little beyond the endocardium. And the, and the out, outside one should be much inside the pericardium. Uh, I don't think you should do that. That quite often you will try to pick up pericardium and it will create difficulty. Oh yes, you should go inside. Dr. Madhu, the, the, you are missing the endocardium altogether, completely. Now, oh, it's outside, no? Yeah, you are missing the endocardium as I been pointing, pointed out. You are outside. You need to come inside. Bring it more inside, as much as, yeah. Okay, okay. Keep it. Machine is taking itself right now. Ah, 
same thing on the septal side also. More inside. We didn't do tissue Doppler, but anyhow, let us uh, see that. Okay. Uh, 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 put some value to this. Yeah. Put some value to this. No, it is correct. So, this, uh, the, the septoapical, if you look at the septo, meso, uh, this thing, yeah. So, there is, a, there is definitely apical sparing and you can clearly see it 18 and 6, the ratio is 3. Saab, Saab is three, which is which is one point in favor of uh, of, of amyloidosis. One point, and the other thing is uh, the uh, the you you average this nineteen, and, and then then you uh, do average of these four segments, and uh, half of that and this. So th that would also if the ratio exceeds one, this is RAS, uh, regional uh, uh, regional strain index, thirty eight. Uh, 1970, 19 and 17, yeah, the, the uh, 38 divided by 37, the, 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 it exceeds 1. So, it is this uh, RSI is also more than 1, it is suggestive of this thing. All right. Yeah. And overall, uh, strain is actually much more lower, it is more in favor of uh, lower they are. Uh, Dr. Madhu, the last thing, LA strain and then we are out. If the LA strains in amyloid are more in the range of about oh, 7, 8, to take in a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they are more in the range of 15, 16. So, we will just do LA strain to get some idea. LA strain is not there in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, the National Amyloid Center has not taken the LA strain as one of the parameters, but there are data to suggest that typically in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, LA strain is around 15, mean no, there is a dedicated LA strain now. Dedicated LA strain is available. Most machines have a CVX has this, uh, this uh, the, the E95 has it. That, that should bother you 9%. I told you the hypertrophic cardiac, they are more in median of 15, they are more like 8, 9 actually. This should bother you. This should bother you. So, uh, if I have to make a, I, I would write all the findings, I will say uh, cardiac amyloidosis must be ruled out. First, The, the uh, point is any ventricle which gets thickened, crypts can be seen. All walls which get thickened, crypts can be seen. Right, doctor. Okay. Just giving by uh, by plane uh, data. All right. So, right. Dr. Madhu will okay. stand and even sharpen. All right. Okay. Dr. Madhu, next case. Thank okay. you very much. Thanks a lot. Actually, uh, his findings will we'll give a report slightly later on. We'll dictate the report. The, the patient can be excused and we can get on with the next work. Any questions so far? No, the people sit. Yes, sir. So, we, do, we no longer do M mode actually, that is not recommended. But, but the, if you see the bit turbulence there in the plaques view, with the color, or if you go to the fourth chamber, that can be also uh, appreciated. Or so, we are not taking but, it now. You can just use the, uh, the uh, typical uh, the, uh, classic 2D, you don't have, the, the only way I do, I will tell you M mode I do Nothing, sir. for two purposes. Okay. IVC and TAPC. I am being honest. I don't know. And sir, also one thing. Uh, once you are uh, uh, taking the uh, diastole size actually in LV, how you linear the papillary muscle with LV cavity? Because you are also measuring the papillary muscle. Might because it is so thickened. So you can make a mistake there.
This is no clarity. How much? How can you measure the apical? No, in general, if the other walls are less than 12 millimeter and the apical walls are more than 12 millimeter, it is it is apical hypertrophy. Okay. Whether it is apical hypertrophy, cardiomyopathy or yes. not is a yes. different story. That I'm telling you, sir. How can you limit the apical ap apical ischem? Sir, yes. Apical ischem. How can you? I mean, differentiate uh, from? No. So the uh, the first thing actually we mentioned the ECG is classic. So you okay. have to look at the ECG. That is the first thing. Mm -hmm. Those yeah. giant T waves yeah, in, yes. in the in the precordial mm -hmm. leads actually yeah. usually are apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, mm -hmm. but still 50% genotype positivity is there. Okay. So don't forget okay. that also. And wall thick ace of spade typical ace of spade appearance. Yes, yes, that is but important. But the stain would help you. The stain at that area will be lower. Okay. So you if you do a bull's eye. It will be blank right in the center. You see a white. Yeah, yes, yes. White that, spot. That, that is apical hypertrophic. Okay. Cardiomyopathy. Thank you, sir. Sir, one more variety. I got few cases. Uh, mid cavity obstruction with apical dyskinesia or akinesia. Yeah, that is usually yeah. mid cavity. Usually mid cavity. Yes. There also the apex will show re reduced yeah. thing. Yeah. So the uh, lot of people call that also apical variety. Actually, it is said that true apex is difficult to see by uh, by echo, mm -hmm. and hence uh, if you are really trying to look for an apical aneurysm or apical dyskinesis. You should more often do a cardiac MRI. But you are right, sometimes it's too severe. Yeah, there is an article in Jack. Uh, it says you, that that variety is very prone to develop arrhythmia yes, and the thrombus. So, so we so, need to look at the apex very carefully so in mid cavity the, obstruction. The, uh, the phenotypes which are high risk are number one, apical aneurysm, number two, wall thickness, diastole wall thickness, any place 30 millimeter or more. Mm -hmm. That is the second. But uh, uh, resting gradient more than 30 millimeter of mercury. Uh, mean, I love yes. No, 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 it's not a mean gradient. It's a systolic gradient. It's a peak systolic gradient. It's a peak systolic gradient. Uh, uh, he thinks then left, that, atrium, that's the left, atrium, left atrium size more than 45 millimeter. No, I mean, we are talking echo only actually. So late gadolinium still is not there in European guidelines. European okay, guidelines then okay. takes family history, ventricle tachycardia, and holter, and there are six points, each one, and the four we have already Just discussed, then the two points for this, six. If more than six or more are they, they, they highly recommended, less than four, uh, no, four to six maybe, I feel. Uh, I think also one more comment is uh, all patients of suspected HCM should be screened for sleep studies, sleep apnea, because there is a lot of coexistence they have and all patients of sleep apnea should be uh, evaluated for HCM. Sleep, sleep studies like, you know, vitamin D deficiency. Everybody should be done. It has no meaning, but should be done. Because everybody writing papers on that. You are aware of that, that everybody writing paper on obstructive sleep apnea, hypertension, Diabetes, pre-diabetes. Especially since Bapi Lahiri is uh, death. Yes. We Bapi have to publish Lahiri. something actually. We have to publish something. So, no, thank you. No, we didn't. We didn't actually look at the. the this was an indeterminate diastolic dysfunction, but the E2 prime will be markedly raised. In this we didn't do tissue Doppler. We were running short of time. Actually, it's an excellent case, but you know, time constraint was uh, not allowed. We should have done good amount of good tissue Doppler in this case, certainly. We should have looked at the S prime or tricuspid annulus to find out RV dysfunction. We should have done the strain of the right ventricle. This would have given us more, more clues actually. The, uh, we were looking for the, uh, the 555 sign actually. If the all uh, systolic velocity, early diastolic, late diastolic velocity are less than 5 centimeters, they are strongly suggestive of cardiac amyloidosis. We didn't do all these things, we were running short of time. We I minimum know, spend one hour, more than one yeah. hour in such patients. We are, we, are, we are acutely aware of the fact that there are many things we didn't do. We will we will actually talk about that in the afternoon. I am going to speak about that. So we will talk about that. Um, it's so this is another patient. 
starting again with the IVC. The next page. So I wish is well collapsing. So I have a question to where is my laptop? Can you give it to somebody or there? My laptop there? Trying to do something with that? No. But we have three connections and you can't get it on, you know. So the, uh, again the same thing, as I said, regardless of uh, uh, whatever is the case, we always start uh, scanning the infeovena cava. And uh, long axis infeovena cava actually means that the cursor points towards the left shoulder, one o'clock position. And okay. then you look at the hepati hepatic veins. The yeah, I will, so the right atrial pressure is 5 or less, let us call it, less than 5. And hepatic veins are not dilated Good. and there is no uh, right side pleural fusion. So there are many things, to, so the, what cardiologists tend to do is miss right side pleural fusion. That is why I always say start with the subcostal view. Okay, then she goes actually to the parasitic long axis view straight away and uh, the uh, Obviously, uh, you, um, you, we know the structures which we see uh, beside the, the right, vent right ventricle outflow tract, left ventricle, aorta, left, left atrium, and we see two valves, aortic and mitral valve, both of which, of course, are significantly involved in the disease process. They're not opening well. There is, of course, uh, atrial fibrillation going on. So, so you have uh, this uh, restricted opening of the vital valve as well as the aortic valve. So and uh, we, we, we can definitely see that the, the reduced opening here, reduce, and there is, a, there is a doming, there is thickening. Uh, you, uh, the, uh, uh, we will first concentrate on the vital valve. So the patient does have mitral stenosis for a moment, we would, uh, we will not really uh, put dop uh, color Doppler or any Doppler on. The thickening is not involving the base, middle is spared, only the proximal one third and tip are thickened. So it is what you call Wilkinson score two for thickening. Subvalor pathology, tip proximal one third, probably middle one third are also involved. You probably will try to call it three by four. Th there is definitely some part which is spared, anything between two and three. Uh, you don't see any calcium score is zero. Mobility wise, the only thing which is not moving is proximal one third and this. So mobility is score is also two. So we know the Wilkin Wilkinson score, it probably falls in seven by 16. That is the first thing which we have to do. You can see the individual thin cords here. So it is not severe subvalvular pathology. Um, we, we need to actually uh, try to, the, the, the um, corneal sinus also tells the patient is not in heart failure, corneal sinus is not dilated. That is a very important clue. Descending thoracic aorta, we, uh, we, we can see more detail, but uh, uh, the aortic valve, the aortic valve, the leaflets are thickened, definitely the, the, the uh, tip as well as the, the uh, coapting margins are thickened. Uh, we are able to see the right coronary cusp and non-coronary. We'll see in short actually all the three cusps. Now the left ventricle is seems to be dilated with uh, doctor. You you want to go ahead with this yes. measurement? You you can do that actually. So uh, Dr. Madhu, just show the measurements of left ventricle and left atrium okay. before we put any color or anything. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so I think uh, uh, we are we, we are doing some chamber quantification in the LV and the LA. Uh, I think we will do LV, LA and uh, RV and uh, the only suggestion is that please uh, let's not have uh, use of M mode uh, for the assessment of LV sizes and, and LA sizes. Yes, so, uh, so, so she is measure, measuring the IVS thickness by 2D measurement and it is 9 
anything more than 1.1 in end diastolic mean that there is a thick uh, septum. So you you measure the LV end diastolic dimensions and the aortic valve dimensions uh, uh, are all uh, there are four dimensions. So uh, the uh, the aorta should be measured Measure. in. If the aortic sign uh, and diastole. It should be diastole. end diastole. And LA of course in end systole. End systole. So systole. this is not the view for LA. Yeah, so I think we'll have a better view. Yeah. Yeah. We can so there are four measurements at the uh, at the level of aortic valve. So if you're, if you're the aortic apparatus, okay. the LVOT or the aortic annulus is in the, in the phase of mid systole. Can we have another uh, view for that? Just bring more of aorta. More okay. of just more just of take okay. one different image. Yeah, more. Yeah, that is better. good. Yeah. There is more of aorta, more of left atrium, more of right palmy artery now. Right palmy artery also two um, indicates that are usually because of the hypertension. And I always suggest that whenever you are doing an LVOT or something, you always zoom it up. Any valvular issue, you want to make a measurement. It is good to zoom it up so that. Uh, so uh, this is mid systole. Mid -systole. Yeah, so yes. mid systole we can measure the 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 uh, and annulus. Annulus, yeah. annulus we can measure. Yeah, inner edge to inner edge in mid systole. So this is uh, around 18, 19. That's that's good. Yeah, uh, this of course is oval. So we don't. Yeah. Actually, I will measure again. Yeah, that's 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 fine. These are all people. I think I have to measure from here. Yeah, that, that's good. So around 20. Every single day. You can save it and then get in the in the diastolic frame. Change the frame. Yeah. I'm speaking every day. You have to be. You are the, uh, at the level of diastole, and you make may measure three. Uh, the sinuses. I I have a backup. I don't need this. Then sinotubular junction. No, why I say I, I, I have, I'll give you that. Sinotubular junction. When I'm presenting, I'll give you my disc. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, what Debika is telling that this is the time where we go for leading to leading edge. But this is sinotubular junction yes, and part of there. ascending aorta. Uh, we are taking from leading. Yeah, that's, that's nice done. And if we take it from here. Yeah. Any questions till now? So this is leading edge to leading edge in the phase of diastole. The LVOT or the aortic annulus is in the mid systole, right? I think we can move ahead. We can. We'd like to uh, have a lot of more things. So the left left atrium, doctor, uh, in the previous patient we have we have seen. So let's go to the uh, the fourth chamber view directly. Uh, we will measure the LA also. Yeah, I think we have done it. So let's yeah. go faster. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to apical four. So I uh, see. Please don't use. M mode for LV ejection fraction. That's because we still get a lot of uh, measurements by TCOX formula. So at this point of time, I would like to tell you that LV, for getting an LV apex, the apex should be conical. And whenever you want to get an LA, there is a specific way of getting an LA view. That apical four chamber view and go slightly above to get an LA view. Yeah. yeah. So you want to comment something? Sir, I have a question. Sir, in the 2D eco view, in the parasternal axis, the way you showed taking the aortic annulus, how accurate is it? Is it actually showing the true aortic annulus? No, it is mostly inaccurate. It is always most of them. Most, you, you should always take it actually in a, in, a, uh, in, a, in a short axis view, measure both maximum diameter, minimum diameter and average the two. The, the, that is why the, the, uh, the transthoracic uh, LVOT or annulus just doesn't correlate with the CT because this is oval. In this view, in parasite longest view, it is oval. You are getting the minor axis. You are not getting the major axis. The major axis in this direction. You are getting this direction. So you will always get shorter. Always. So how, do, how do, to sort it out actually is that you, you go to short axis view at the level of the annulus and then measure it with 2D. Or, or you can use the X plane. The X plane uh, where you are measuring, put the X plane or Y plane. You you can do, do a 3D or and still you are not satisfied. Of course, CT is the, the gold standard to do it. it. 
Yeah, I think th this this point has to be valid that once we have the LVOT, you go for a parasol short axis view and take both this the, the dimensions with the CT. There Validation with CT. With the CT. We always underestimate annulus. We always underestimate the annulus, but the point is all that aortic value area studies are with this underestimation. And that is why now people are saying that 0.8 centimeter should be the cutoff for the aortic value area for severe because you have been systematically underestimating aortic value area by continuity equation, the annulus being undersized. Yeah. We, we always measure the minor axis. And similarly, there is a school of thought which believes that in case you are using CT, then 1.2 centimeter should be taken as cutoff for severe aortic stenosis because CT always gives bigger. You are getting the maximum diameter here, you are get, getting the, the minimum smaller diameter. minimum diameter. Yeah. But you can do a 3D or you can do a biplane view. Biplane uh, gives you, you uh -huh. get it. So, uh, uh, moving ahead in apical four chamber view, there are two points. Whenever you want to look at the LV, the LV try to have the apex conical. And, uh, and when, so can you make the apex slightly conical? Yes. Yeah, this can just go one step down, little bit down in the apex. Very clean. Yeah. It will disappear below this. Yeah, so this is the best she can get. So. At this point, you can have the endastic and encystic flame frame in four chamber and a two chamber view. But when, whenever we want to have the LA view, it is important to make the apex foreshorten. So to get the LA view, for, can you foreshorten the apex now? This is foreshortened. Yeah. yeah. So this the LA becomes prominent. Yeah, so the, the way you do it, just go slightly above in the same place. The LA. This is LA focus view. Earlier, we were doing a zoom view for LA. We don't need it anymore. You can have a four chamber and two chamber LA this focus the, view. This is the apex. So the LV and LA are not in the same axis. LA is more anterior, LV is more posterior. And they are not in the same axis. Their axis is different. They make an angle. The angle is actually, uh, angle is obtuse. So they are not really at 180 degree. That is why you have to measure LA separately for volume and LV separately and that is a little cumbersome. Previous studies measured LA volume and LV in the same four chamber view and that is why those there are discrepancies. So we are trying to rework the whole thing. So now coming to, uh, we got LV, we got LA. Now how to get a good RV view? The earlier recommendation for getting RV view were that we go medially from the apex medially. But now they have changed that we have to go more laterally and turn the, the probe to counterclockwise. counterclockwise. So can you show both the views, uh, Dr. Madhu? Uh, let's go to LV apex. Let's go to LV apex, LV, LV. Okay. okay. And sh she goes medially. She goes medially and she gets the RV. This is not the view. We should not calculate RV through this. Let's go now laterally and turn the probe. Let's go to LV. She's doing great. Can we lighten the apex? Yeah. Can you, can you show there on that side? I don't want my photograph there. Can you show the image there? Can you, can you show Madhu's hand? Camera. No, no, no. The image should be here. The, uh, she should be there. So the point is to get an RV, go outside and turn your probe. Yeah, this is a true RV. Any questions? Yeah. Now, now we are going to the measurements, right? Okay. So let's start with the RV right away because she's on RV. The, the normally RV is smaller than LV. If the RV is same size or the RV is bigger in size, you need to have 2D measurements and there are two, three measurements. Can you measure the base, mid and long axis? 
Madhu, just freeze it. Yes. Yeah. In diastole. Okay. Yeah, correct. And she will measure at the base, 2D measurement. So remember, you are not measuring the tricuspid annulus. You are just above it. I think you have to be slightly lower. Yeah, yeah. yeah slightly just... lower towards the tricuspid valve. Okay, slightly above it. Just go down, go down, go down, go down, go down. No, no, no. Go down. Go down, go down, go down. Base, base. Base, base. We want the base. Okay, okay, okay. Just base, yeah. Just base. Base, mid. And long axis from apex to the mid of annulus. Generally, apex. the long axis is around cutoff is around seven. No, you have long to go up. Way. You have to go up at the tip. You can't see the apex properly, but no. just go down, go down, go down, go down, go down in the annulus. To just the annulus. Correct. The annulus. So roughly, it should be more than seven, seventy mm to be longer. Apex should be up. Yes, you are right. So, I generally do it if the LV is same size of RV or, or if it is bigger than LV. So, these are the 2D measurements, yeah. Correct, correct. Yeah, so basal is often, you know, you, the RV free wall goes out of the uh, picture sometimes. You know, what I, what I will do is, yeah, I, I will just remove it and I can measure it for you. Yeah. So what what from I will here, do is I will measure from I here. think this I I will go this I'm just quickly doing it and if this is the apex yes. I will just go up to here visible. so something like that but I I would like to have a better apex to get the measurement so this is the way we do it then uh, can you remove it there is something called RV OT measurements also but do I do it routinely the answer is no only in research Dr Mohan do you do it routine routinely uh, no, but we actually, uh, what I do for RV is qualitatively, I will measure the RV at the base and if it's more than 45, 45 bothers me. Yeah. But uh, I don't measure fraction area change, I get the, uh, the I actually look at the overall size, yeah. if it is bigger than LVR, yeah, the code yeah. is bigger. Look at the S-prime or tricuspid annulus, do actually the strain of the right ventricle and I am through. Right. Uh, I have an equipment to do 3D volumetry of the, the RV volume. and don't do routinely. It is, I am not in ARVC, do, uh, we have to measure the RVOT in plaques. Yeah, yes. that's, that's, that's a different, different thing. You are right.